Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Stearns. He is Edward P. Best Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. Dr. Stern specializes in life history evolution, which links the fields of ecology and evolutionary biology, and also in evolutionary medicine, and those are the topics that we're going to talk about today. So, Dr. Stearns, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Ricardo. It's very nice to be here. Okay, great. So, um, in your work, you talk a lot about life history theory. So could you tell us what life history theory is and also where it's sort of positioned in the broader context of evolutionary biology or evolutionary theory? Sure. Life history theory uh, really started to be developed seriously about 1970. So it's uh, roughly 50 years old now. And uh, it arose at a time when people were trying to figure out how to construct a predictive theory of the evolution of phenotypes. At the time, we had a very good apparatus for studying population genetics that told us how we could expect gene frequencies to change in populations. But we didn't have a predictive theory that would tell us how traits would change in populations. By traits, I mean things in life history theory, the traits that we study are things like size at birth, uh, age and size of maturity, number of reproductive events per lifetime, uh, interval between reproductive events, the relationship between growth and fertility and mating success, and things like that. You notice I didn't use the word gene at all when I was describing those things. Those are all, however, they are all central to evolutionary theory because the, they're not only life history traits. They are components of Darwinian fitness. They are the things that combine at the end of a lifetime to yield the number of surviving offspring that a particular combination of traits has produced. And so that was the handle that made it possible to develop a theory because there's a mathematical relationship that we get between the distribution of these events and mortality rates and the number of offspring produced at the end of the lifetime. And that is what allowed life history theory to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. so you, you, you can, well, one way to think of it is uh, as uh, a phenotypic theory of the components of fitness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the traits that are associated with life history theory, I mean, where do they come from? Are they the result of uh, selective pressures? I, I mean, are they part, do they characterize, let's put it that way, a particular species and they are the same for all individuals or are, are they mostly, let's say, developmental and they depend on the kinds of uh, environmental factors particular individuals are, are put through during their lifetime? Well, let me, uh, that's a complicated question and let me go back and take it apart a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the state of an organism when we look at them, for example, you, uh, is determined both by your evolutionary history and by your developmental experiences since you've been born. Mm -hmm. And life history theory tries to accommodate both kinds of causation. And uh, in terms of evolutionary history, the human life history uh, is one that consists of uh, organisms that are born at, say, about three kilos, two and a half or three kilos, and they mature uh, and have their first offspring, usually somewhere between the ages of 18 and 30 now. And uh, they tend to have an offspring, if they are a hunter-gatherer, they tend to have an offspring about once every three to five years. And if they are in a developed country, of course, there's cultural things that change that. But uh, they 
probably don't have a capacity for having more than at a maximum about 25 offspring per lifetime and usually much less. They stop reproducing. Uh, women stop reproducing when they're between uh, about 45 and 50 years old. And men usually stop reproducing a bit more slowly, but by the time they're a bit older than that. And they die when they are somewhere around, uh, somewhere between 70 and 90 years old now. Mm-hmm. So if you take that as a characterization of one species, we can say that that is a pattern that has been shaped by natural selection to give an evolutionary solution to the ecological problems that humans were faced with in their past. And that it was this kind of distribution of births and reproductive investments and timings that resulted in success in things that we see today, like you talking to me. Um, So that's one level of explanation, and it relies upon natural selection operating over evolutionary time periods in the past. Part of that uh, process, however, also shaped the capacity of those organisms to respond developmentally to the environments they encounter. We call that phenotypic plasticity or developmental plasticity, and it means things like this. If you take identical twins, so they have the same genes, and you separate them at birth, and you feed one of them well, and you feed the other one of them poorly, so that one of them grows rapidly and the other one grows slowly, the one that grows rapidly will have its first child earlier than the one that grows slowly. So that's a, uh, there are many other aspects of the environment that affect life history traits, but that's just a very simple example to show that although there is an evolutionary history that has shaped life histories, there's also a developmental experience in the life of each individual that shapes what you actually see in the organism. Mm -hmm. So life history theory also has to do with that uh, distinction between R and K uh, selection or R and K approaches to uh, reproduction and, and things like that, correct? Well, um, I have been a critic of the concept of case selection in the past, mm-hmm. and uh, however, I can un- I can parse that for your listeners so that mm-hmm. they know both what those concepts mean and sure. where where I stand on it and why I st- why I take that stance. R and K selection was one of the first ways that people thought about thinking about life histories. R represents the rate at which a population grows, and K represents the size that a population can attain. And uh, there was a distinction made between species that were thought to have evolved under conditions where they normally were growing exponentially, probably because they were being uh, either eaten by predators or infected by diseases, and so they never had an opportunity to fully saturate their environment by which I mean they never got to the point that they were limiting themselves because they had eaten up all of their resources. K uh, selection means that, oh, if a species is K selected, it spent most of its evolutionary history uh, under conditions where it is mostly being limited by competition with other organisms, either of its own species or of other species, and therefore its biological properties are shaped to optimize its competitive ability in times of resource scarcity, rather than its ability to grow rapidly at a time when resources are relatively abundant. And it was thought that uh, at that point, this is now 50 years ago, that organisms could be usefully ordered along a continuum from R selected to K selected. So that was the pattern. Now, for a variety of reasons, I became frustrated with that explanation. And I think the primary reason was that there was no, there, while there was a clear connection between how fast a population would grow and what its life history traits were, there was not a clear connection between the size it would attain, its K value, and its life history traits. Those were not then, at that point, present in equations. They couldn't be analyzed. They couldn't be taken apart. Furthermore, it was evident that organisms varied in more than just that dimension. So 
the idea was uh, initially that, oh, some organisms mature early, they're small, they have lots of babies, and they die young. And at the other end, those were the R-selected ones. And at the other end, there were the ones that were supposed to be K-selected. They were large, they grew slowly, they matured late, and they had a few offspring in which they invested a lot. They tended to live a long time. And at a first cut, that is an interesting distinction, and it calls attention to some of the big differences we see out there in life histories. But organisms vary in many more dimensions than that. They vary in how frequently they give birth. They vary in uh, the different details of the patterns of their reproductive investment. And uh, there was another more scientifically let's say, philosophical aspect of that explanation. It was one that said, here's a pattern. And we see some things that are correlated with that pattern. And that explains something. And that is not a way of explaining things in science with which I am satisfied. There are some people who aren't, but I'm not. What I like to see is a prediction that we can test with an experiment and get at what caused the pattern rather than simply being happy that we see a correlation in a pattern. So it was a very good starting point, but it led to a bit of a controversy. And uh, the alternative to that that emerged was that we can look at the age-specific patterns of mortality and reproduction, and we can ask if an environment imposes a certain age or stage-specific pattern of mortality and reproduction on a species, how do we expect that species to evolve to deal with that issue? So that could be imposed by weather or by predators or by diseases or by food availability or by many different things, but it would result in a particular impact of the environment on how an organism survives and reproduces. And by changing the focus from R and K to age-specific mortality and reproduction, it turned out that we gained a great deal of concrete predictive ability. And that also transformed the framework into one that was susceptible more to experimental test. So, yes, what I've told you to go back and summarize is R and K selection has been an important starting concept in the field. Uh, It was provocative and it uh, stimulated a lot of research, but I think that for most people who are working in the field, it has been largely replaced. However, having said that, let me say the one sense in which it has not been replaced. Mm -hmm. K selection emphasizes the impact of density dependent processes on evolution. And by density dependent, I mean if a population grows to the point where organisms are really competing strongly with each other, then their population density is constraining their ability to grow and reproduce, and it becomes an important part of the selection that they encounter. Um, There is a large and interesting group of theorists now who are studying the impact of density-dependent processes on life history evolution. And I know that you're going to get to the interaction between evolution and ecology. And this is one of the very important places where life history evolution interacts with ecology. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that group is basically looking at what is called eco-evolutionary feedback. So that's a interesting kind of abstract phrase, but let me unpack it a little bit. Mm -hmm. What it means is that there are ecological processes like population growth and regulation that affect selection pressures that then change the traits that determine how a population grows. And so the ecological process of population growth and resource use affects the selection pressures, which by the way are operating directly and primarily on life history traits such as size and number of babies and survival rates, and that that then determines the subsequent progress of ecology, and it's a feedback loop. It just keeps going. So the analysis of density-dependent effects on life history evolution in that context of eco-evolutionary feedback has become an important and growing part of the field. It's being spearheaded primarily by people who work on fisheries, and it's used to predict fish life histories. Mm 
And uh, it is centered uh, at this point primarily in Austria, the Netherlands, and Norway, with some important contributions coming from England, Canada, and the United States. So it's a truly international scientific collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in terms of individual variation within the same species, um, is it the case that there are some innate predispositions that individuals have to follow a particular life history, a more fast-paced or a, a slower-paced life history strategy, or, or does it, or is it a result mostly of the environmental, ecological factors they are exposed to? Well, first, let me say that almost nothing about the evolution of traits is an either or between is it nature or is it nurture? It's normally an interact. It's normally an interaction between genes and environment. What you are addressing is uh, a set of ideas that uh, have been elaborated mostly by evolutionary psychologists and evolutionary anthropologists mm -hmm. who have been studying the way that humans react to the experience of stress or risk. And their assertion is that young humans, young boys and girls, who encounter stress or risk, things like starvation or a father deserting a family or something like that, will have a fast life history by which they mean they will mature earlier and they will take more risks early in life. And that those who are raised in a secure and supportive environment will have a slower life history. So they will mature later, they will take less risks, and they will basically have, a, have, have fewer reproductive events and space them out more in time and probably live longer. The, uh, the sort of rough logic that underlies that is that organisms that get a signal that they're going to die anyway for other purposes have good evolutionary reasons to take risks to try to reproduce quickly before they die. So if you're, for example, growing up in an environment uh, in a criminal milieu where a lot of people are taking drugs and committing suicide and uh, couples are unstable and parents are disappearing, that might suggest that it would be advantageous from an evolutionary point of view to mature early and have as many babies as you can because you're probably going to die anyway before you get to be 30 or 40 years old. That's kind of the rough argument. However, I would like to note that there isn't any formal life history theory that predicts that kind of intraspecific variation. The argument was based actually on an analogy with RNK selection, which you brought up earlier. And RNK selection basically said there should be some fast things and there should be some slow things. And RNK selection was basically comparing insects with elephants, <laughs> right? It was comparing small, rapidly living things with large, slowly living things. And it was looking at comparisons not just across species, but across whole large groups of organisms and doing it. When you're looking at differences among individuals within a single population, you need to be careful about how you construct your theory because there are lots of other things that come into play. Individuals within populations may be related to each other and their fitness is expressed not only in the number of offspring they have per lifetime, but in the number of offspring that their relatives have per lifetime. And that is mediated by the way they interact with those relatives. So those concepts of relatedness and kin selection need to be incorporated into a theory of life history for, say, humans that also allows for the kind of phenotypic plasticity we've just been discussing. It allows for the fact that the same genes might encounter different environments and therefore they need evolved rules of thumb to deal with the different environments. They need to know how to play these different sorts of games. That kind of explicit theory has not yet been well developed and tested for humans. And so what's happened is that the speculations in evolutionary psychology and evolutionary anthropology have run a bit ahead of the 
logical apparatus that's really needed to see if those speculations make sense. Uh, they are intriguing. I think that they are very interesting. I think that there's going to be a lot of work in that area. But right at this point in time, I do not yet trust very many of the conclusions that are being drawn. Mm -hmm. I understand. So we've already talked a little bit about phenotypic plasticity, but I would like to ask you one more question about it. So is it that uh, a particular organism, I mean, the, the extent to which it is uh, phenotypically plastic, is it genetically set or determined? I mean, the, the I would perhaps amount is not the best word, but the degree to which they can be um, phenotypically plastic. Well, as you are by now thoroughly aware, everything in biology is a bit complicated. Let me put yeah. it this way. Yeah. It is possible for phenotypic plasticity itself to evolve and for organisms that had the same ancestor, some of which were exposed to some environments and others exposed to others, to, do, to evolve different degrees of phenotypic plasticity, actually different kinds of phenotypic plasticity. However, it is also true that some phenotypic plasticity is simply an inescapable consequence of chemistry and physics. Mm -hmm. We are big old sacks of molecules. We are systems of chemical reactions. We are composed of matter that must obey the laws of chemistry and physics. And so, uh, if we take organisms and we rear some of them, uh, let, let's say we take, not, not humans, but let's say we take something like flies or earthworms or something that doesn't regulate its temperature, and we rear some of them in cold environments and some of them in warm environments, you will notice differences. Those are phenotypically plastic responses. Now, some of them are inevitable, and they would happen whether there had been any evolutionary history or not, simply because when it's colder, chemical reactions slow down. Things can't grow as fast. However, there is also the capacity in evolution to fine-tune our systems of chemical reactions in such a way that a component of that response can be adaptive. And I think that this leads us to one of the ideas that will probably be coming up, uh, that we'll be mentioning again when we discuss evolutionary medicine. Mm -hmm. That is, that organisms can be considered to be well matched to the environments that they have encountered frequently, and that would include well-matched in terms of the kind of phenotypic plasticity they have to deal with that range of environments. But they may be mismatched or poorly matched to environments that they've never seen before. It takes evolution some time to change the whole genetic and developmental and physiological system to deal with a new set of environments. And uh, in evolutionary medicine, we have multiple examples, I think, of where uh, modern humans who have recently radically changed their environments are mismatched to their current environments. And it can happen to organisms as well. It's happening to them all over the world as we go through global warming. And as patterns of weather and temperature change across the planet. Organisms are being challenged in ways that they don't really have very much recent evolutionary history to inform them about solutions to the problems that they're facing. And uh, interestingly, it's almost a synonym for mismatch is, oh, now natural selection is operating on them. If they're mismatched, then some of them are dying and others are surviving. The ones that are better matched are surviving. The ones that are not so well matched are dying. And that generates a process of natural selection that will eventually return to a good match and to a state of reasonable adaptation to the environment. But when environments change, it takes time to catch up. Now, when we ask, how does phenotypic plasticity evolve in that regard? The answer is that we can expect natural selection to shape the phenotypically plastic reaction of a population of organisms to those environments that they have frequently encountered, but not to those that they've never encountered or which are rare. And so if in the past 
it was very common in a human population for some organisms to be starving and other organisms to be well fed. And if both of those groups of organisms then contributed genes to future generations, and by the way, just by the terms of uh, biology, they wouldn't. The well-fed ones would be contributing more than the starved ones. But let's say that there were enough of the starved ones contributing to bring in genetic information on that condition, then there would be the potential to have an adaptive phenotypic plasticity that told the organism, this is how you re should react when you're starving, and this is how you should react when you're well-fed. But it's important to note, those things have to have been frequently encountered in the past, and there has to have been enough time for that process of adaptation to have occurred. Mm -hmm. So another thing came to my mind now. Um, does culture have, have anything to do with phenotypic plasticity? Because, I mean, in humans and other animals as well, but not to the same extent, I guess, uh, because of culture, we have ways of getting information from conspecifics that allows for us to more quickly uh, adapt and survive and reproduce, that is, be, be evolutionarily successful in changing environments. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. There's no question that culture has a huge impact on human biology. And the way that genes and culture co-evolve uh, is a fascinating and currently a fairly hot area of research. And the arrival of culture in the evolutionary process, which is most striking in humans and is foreshadowed in some other species, really took a quantum leap with the invention of language and the transmission of information in ways other than genetic transformation. Mm -hmm. And that's the fundamental distinction. It's how is information transmitted? And once we had culture, then it was possible to transmit information on stuff that worked and stuff that didn't work, not only from parents to offspring, but horizontally to friends, acquaintances, relatives, students. <laughs> um, and that changed the whole dynamic uh, greatly. I think the most important thing to, to note about the interaction of culture, cultural evolution with genetic, genetic evolution is that cultural evolution is much faster. Mm -hmm. And that means that as long as culture is changing rapidly, the genes that are interacting with culture are running to catch up and they probably never will. And what that means is that we're probably going to be permanently genetically mismatched to our cultural environment. Permanently. It will just keep going. Uh, there are many, many ways in which culture has changed selection pressures. And when you just start listing some of the things that we can name as being parts of culture, I think you'll see what I mean. Agriculture. Mm -hmm. The agricultural revolution is a big one. Uh, urbanization, which accompanied agriculture. So moving from small groups into, of, of related individuals into big groups of unrelated individuals. Yes. That completely transformed our ecology and it exposed us to a whole new set of uh, diseases and it created all kinds of opportunities for disease transmission that didn't previously exist. Probably, though, the biggest things that are acting on humans as selection pressures now that have been created by culture are public health and medicine. So the parts of public health that have done it are primarily clean water, antibiotics, and vaccines. And the parts of medical practice that have done it are, of course, uh, not only the fact that we have scientific medicine and medical plans and modern antiseptic surgery and hospitals and things like that, but we also have medical care systems. And part of that is the whole delivery of medical care to an entire population. That has radically changed patterns of survival and reproduction in humans. And uh, the biggest impact on, uh, on our evolution is that 
it's much less likely now that a baby will die as an infant or that a mother will die in childbirth. Both of those have changed strikingly over the last two or three hundred years. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the selection on our life histories has also changed. So that, that's part of evolutionary medicine, but it connects directly to life history evolution because think of it like this. Go back to about, say, 1750 in a European country where the average life expectancy was about 35. It's true. Uh, and let us assume that the human life history at that point had been brought into balance by natural selection. That would mean that any mother at that point who reproduced earlier than natural selection would have told her to do would be paying a cost. She would be more likely to have a baby that died. If she reproduced later, she would be losing reproductive opportunities because her lifespan was limited and she might not have so many chances to reproduce. And so she was choosing a point at which to reproduce that was somewhere in the middle. And, and back in 1750, it was probably about the age of 22 or so. Now, what modern medicine has done is it's basically, and, and public health, it's basically greatly reduced the cost of reproducing earlier, which means that now women who do reproduce earlier, say at the age of 18 or 17 or 16, quote, get away with it. <laughs> Their babies also survive. Yeah. And, and uh, you can just think of the way that medicine then changes the costs and benefits of different patterns of reproduction. And that changes the selection on life history traits. So there have been five or six big studies of natural selection operating on contemporary human populations. They've been done in the United States, the UK, Australia, and Scandinavia, and Canada. And all of them say that natural selection is currently operating to reduce the age at first reproduction, at the time, the age at which a, a woman first gives birth. However, that is a purely biological argument. It doesn't have a cultural component. If you look at what's been happening in our culture with uh, two career families and women staying on in higher education and uh, the whole movement for sexual equality and opportunity, then you see a cultural pressure for delayed reproduction made possible by the technological innovations of contraception and by the shifting roles of sex and by changes in who has control over a woman's body. Women now have more control over their bodies than they used to, although that's not true everywhere in the world. It's certainly a tendency in that direction, and it's a good thing. And it's happened a lot more in developed countries than in some less developed countries. What that has done is it, the biology is saying, hey, having a baby early in life doesn't cost you so much anymore, so you should reproduce earlier. And culture is saying, hey, if you want a satisfying career, and you want fulfillment that way, you need to reproduce later so that you can get all of this education and invest in your career early. What that's doing is that it's increasing the portion of a person's life in which they feel a conflict between their cultural expectations and their biological reality. So I think that it is an interesting and important aspect of gene culture conflict which is actually generated by the different kinds of directions that genetic evolution, biological evolution, and cultural evolution are pushing us. And I think all you have to do is go out and uh, talk to women who are pursuing fulfilling careers and who are between the ages of 30 and 40, and I think they will report that they feel conflict. Mm -hmm. So before we talk more about evolutionary medicine, let me just ask you, I mean, we've, you've already talked a, a bit about this before, but uh, the link between ecology and evolutionary biology and how life history theory uh, provides us with an opportunity to link both fields. I mean, do you, want, do you have something to add to that? Well, I would like to point out that if you take a course in ecology and you want to understand how population dynamics, how do, how do populations grow, mm 
you immediately run into models that focus on birth and death rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, you run into the whole apparatus of demography. So uh, that means that you're going to see life tables, that is, tables of survival rates and birth rates and age-specific death rates and things like that. And ecologists use that to try to predict how populations will change over time, even if they are not evolving. However, all of those elements of those ecological models are traits that themselves evolve. And this was first noticed, as I said, about 50 to 60 years ago, and it resulted in the field of life history evolution. And so what happened is that the evolutionary biologists went off and they developed uh, predictions about life history evolution and tested them and discovered that they worked pretty well in some cases. And for a while, the ecologists uh, just continued to deal with populations as, those though, as though those traits were not evolving. And the reason they did it, it's not that they were stupid. It was that at that time, people didn't think that evolution had happened very fast. And so they thought that, gee, if we're looking at ecological processes occurring on ecological time scales, which is a matter of, say, five or ten generations or something like that, we don't need to worry about evolution because evolution will be changing the trade slowly. But starting again in about 1970 and continuing, with some work that I did, but some work very importantly that Peter and Rosemary Grant did on Galapagos finches and that David Resnick did on guppies, we began to realize that evolution can occur in ecological time and that you will get evolutionary changes in traits like life history traits over the course of, say, 10, 20, 30 generations, something like that, and that is fast enough to change the properties, the ecological properties of those populations so that their birth and death rates then start to change. Now, the reason this happens is that most of those traits we've been talking about, all the things that are contributing to birth and death rates, those are shaped by many genes that have small effects. And the previous conception of evolution is something that changes very slowly, had been shaped by a population genetic theory that concentrated on single genes that had large effects. Mm -hmm. Well, if here, just to give you an idea of the difference, if you start with a mutation for a gene that allows people to digest milk without having diarrhea and stomach cramps somewhere in Central Asia, about 9,000 years ago, and you give those people who can then use milk as a food source when they're adults, that is after they're weaned, when they're about two or three years old, and you just give them a small selective advantage, say about uh, 3% or 5%, meaning that the ones who can digest milk can have about three or 5% more babies per lifetime than the ones who can't, it takes roughly five to 10,000 years for that advantageous gene to rise to high frequency in a population to the point that we now see in Scandinavia or the Netherlands where 90% of the people in those populations can do that. There's still many people in the world who are lactose intolerant and who are not able to digest milk when they are adults. And so that process is still continuing. So that kind of analysis, which is quite consistent with one or two genes that have large effects, takes time. The difference in life history traits is that you have something like, how big is the baby? Or at what age do you reproduce? And traits like that are affected by hundreds of genes that have small effects. And they're all, uh, the alternatives for those genes are all there at some kind of intermediate frequency in the population. And so when you change the selection pressure, hundreds of things start to respond at the same time. And the processes are occurring in parallel. And all of those little processes occurring in parallel add up to a more rapid response. And that is why we can have some kinds of evolution that occur in ecological time. Now, once you have that sort of feedback, I'll go back and I'll revisit a concept that I mentioned earlier, uh, 
you have eco-evolutionary feedbacks. An ecological change produces an evolutionary reaction that produces an ecological change that produces an evolutionary reaction, and that cycle just keeps continuing. And the ecology is therefore important to explain the evolution, and the evolution becomes important to explain the ecology. That is, uh, there, by, by the way, that doesn't always happen. But it happens now, I think, in cases that we see with increasing frequency. And it means that the barriers between academic disciplines are breaking down because people have recognized that they need to be able to think about both things at once. And uh, it goes on not only in population dynamics, it also goes on in the evolution of behavior and of mating systems. Uh, we can now we now have a well worked out apparatus of evolutionary game theory, which tells us basically you use game theory when the behavioral strategy that one player adopts depends on the strategy that another player is adopting, and much of behavior occurs with that kind of interaction. That was developed by George Price and John Maynard Smith and others, starting again in around 1970. And the particular game that will get played occurs, in an, it's an evolutionary game, but occurs in an ecological framework. So one of the standard setups uh, for this sort of thinking is what kind of mating system should a species have? Should, it, should a female be mating with a single male or with many males? Should a male be trying to defend a territory or should a male be trying to protect a harem? Uh, or should there be monogamous pairings? And it turns out that a lot of what explains the broad patterns is actually the distribution of food in the landscape and the distribution of hiding places and safe places in the landscape. And one simple but not general rule is that females find food and males find females. And if the food is clumped, then males come into competition with each other, and that generates the possibility for females to choose among males. But if the food is widely dispersed, and all of the organisms have to forage, then there's no opportunity for a male to defend a territory or form a harem, and you have a whole different kind of mating system. So you can see that there, what's going on is the ecology, which is the spatial distribution and abundance of food resources and other kinds of resources, is actually generating the whole evolutionary framework within which mating behavior is evolving. That is an area of biology that's now part of behavioral ecology. And it also represents another case in which ecology and evolution have come together in ways that lead to very powerful insights and which basically cause the boundaries between pre-existing fields to vanish. You have to be able to think across those boundaries now in order to be a good researcher. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's now change topics and talk about evolutionary medicine. Uh, you've already touched on some of the topics the discipline is interested in and the kinds of questions it deals with, but uh, in what ways does it differ from, let's say, traditional mainstream medicine? I mean, what are the kinds of things that perhaps uh, evolutionary medicine is um, better equipped to deal with that standard mainstream medicine uh, is not that good? Well, first, evolutionary medicine isn't a discipline like genetics or biochemistry or cell biology or something like that. It simply consists of all the ways in which an evolutionary insight impacts some aspect of medical or public health practice or research uh, to give some new interesting added value. It certainly does not replace traditional medicine. It is a different way of looking at medical problems that has the potential for giving some additional interesting insights. So, 
it's not a discipline, it's not a different way of doing medicine, it's a way of contributing additional insights to existing ways of doing medicine. Now, I would break down the most direct, uh, say, clinical contributions of evolutionary insights into the way that we use antibiotics to treat infections, the way that we understand cancer, and the way that we think about uh, our responses to um, autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. So first, to go to the antibiotics. You know, uh, when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, he discovered resistance to penicillin in bacterial populations, and it had evolved within six months of his discovery. And uh, that pattern has repeated. We now know that if a drug discovery program comes up with a new antibiotic and it starts to be used widely, that the bacteria against which it is being used uh, will evolve resistance to it within uh, six months to two years, and that that resistance will then spread around the globe. It is estimated that it takes about six months for resistance to evolve to a new antibiotic in a hospital in the UK, and another two years for that resistance to appear in bacterial populations in Hong Kong. That's roughly the timeline. And the whole history of antibiotic development has been one of initial success followed by disappointment. And so you see whole classes of drugs, first develop, uh, the sulfa drugs and penicillin and things like that being developed, and then other, other chemical types of drugs being developed. And every time they've been developed, some bacterial population has evolved resistance to them. Now, the evolutionary genetics of how bacteria do that turns out to be extremely important. Bacteria uh, have a circular chromosome, which is their main library of genetic information. But they also have inside their cells smaller circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. And when bacteria have sex, basically what they do is they line up next to each other and they make a little bridge and those plasmids can go through from one bacterium to another. It turns out that bacteria have placed most of the functions they need for their basic metabolism, you know, how they eat and how they reproduce on their big circular chromosome, and they have put most of their antibiotic resistance factors into those little plasmids. So if you now genetically analyze virulence, or excuse me, not virulence, but resistance in a population, and you look at how it is lined up on one of those plasmids, you can look down that plasmid and you'll see, oh, here is a gene that gives resistance to penicillin. And here's a gene that gives resistance to streptomycin. And then sitting next to it is a gene that gives resistance to cipro, cipro, ciproflaxin. And you can see up to maybe 20 different resistance genes all packed together now. This has taken 50 years for the bacteria to assemble, but now they just hand it off to each other. And this through sex, and this can then spread rapidly through a bacterial population. So that's a nice piece of basic research information. But uh, one of the more interesting and controversial ideas has to do with the issue of whether or not when a patient comes in with an infection, is there already a resistance gene in that population of bacteria, or has the resistance gene not yet evolved because a mutation has not yet occurred for it? If the mutation is not yet there, then the best thing you can do is give a large dose of antibiotics and continue it for five or 10 days and complete that dose because that greatly reduces the size of the bacterial population and therefore the probability with which a resistance mutation will occur. But if that resistance mutation is in there at the beginning because of past evolutionary history and since antibiotics have been invented more, there have been literally millions of tons of antibiotics that have been released into the environment. So there's been a lot of selection on bacteria and there's a lot of antibiotic resistance out there. So if that infection has that mutation in it, 
and we now apply a lot of antibiotics to it, what we're doing is we're not killing the resistant ones, we're wiping out their competition. And we're selecting for resistance. And so some people have suggested that instead of using a large dose of antibiotics and always completing it, what we should do is we should use a smaller dose and then watch the infection. And if you start feeling better, you should stop taking the antibiotics because you've reduced the population size of the bacteria. And now you can hope that your natural immune system will take over and eliminate the infection. This idea has been tested and it has worked in some cases, and there are cases now in which doctors are starting to use it sometimes. However, the medical community at large has not accepted this insight, and I think the reason they haven't accepted it is that they often don't know if there is a resistant mutation in there. They can find out. They have to plate out the cultures, and they have to go through a process, but it's expensive, and it's time-consuming, and often they don't feel they have time. As a result of which, we continue to use antibiotics much more frequently than they really ought to be used. And as a result, our current medical practice is often uh, really strongly driving the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Now, that leads to the next step. What happens when all the hospitals of the world are populated by resistant strains of bacteria? Well, that's really a very frightening prospect because all of our modern surgery is based on our ability to undertake antiseptic surgery and if an infection occurs to treat it with antibiotics. So it will make surgery much more risky and mortality rates after surgery will go up a great deal. Not to mention, of course, the fact that we'll have a lot of mortality from bacterial infections outside the hospital. So people have started to think, are there ways of treating bacterial infections that don't involve antibiotics or that are in some sense evolution proof that where the evolutionary process won't occur when bacteria encounter antibiotics. There's been some interesting progress on that. One of them is to use viruses that kill bacteria to treat bacterial infections. Those viruses are called phage and therefore this kind of therapy is called phage therapy. Now, we've known about phage since about 1910, so it's been over 100 years that we've known that there are viruses that kill bacteria. And in fact, the French scientist who discovered phage suggested that they be used to attack bacteria 100 years ago. That was taken up and it was used in uh, Eastern Europe. In fact, there has been an institute of phage therapy in the Republic of Georgia for a long time. But it wasn't until we really ran into the problem of antibiotic resistance in Europe and North America and Japan and China that other people began to think, well, there might really be something in phage therapy and began to test it. I have colleagues here at Yale who have done something very clever, and it uses ideas that are both based on phage therapy, but they also interestingly include the idea of a trade-off, which comes from life history evolution. What they did was they looked for phage that would attack a bacterium in such a way that it reduced the bacterium's ability to resist the antibiotic. It wasn't just any phage. It was a phage that would go in and it would destroy the bacterial ability to resist the antibiotic. Then the bacterial population is faced with a dilemma. It can either evolve resistance to the phage or resistance to the antibiotic, but it can't do both. Once they had located this, they then tried it in a clinical trial on a man who was dying. And he knew he was dying and because this, he knew he was a doctor, actually, and he knew he had about two or three months to live. And all of the available antibiotics uh, had failed, and uh, he had an infection in his chest. He had a chest implant, he had a pacemaker in his chest, and there was a bacterial film that was growing over it. And all of the available antibiotics had been used to try to eliminate it, and none, none worked. So what they did was they found a virus that would attack uh, 
the specific mechanism in those bacteria that were making it resistant to the antibiotics, they flooded him with these phage, these viruses, which, by the way, only attack bacteria. They don't attack the cells in his body. And then after he had been hit by the phage, they then hit him with the antibiotic again. It completely eliminated the infection, and it saved his life. And he's still here. He's now in his early 80s. Mm -hmm. And once people had heard of this, they began to get very interested in phage therapy in the United States, particularly for people who have infections of bacteria in their lungs because they have cystic fibrosis. And that's something that attacks young people. Mm -hmm. And to date, of that team that has developed this technique has saved the lives of 11 people who had untreated, previously untreatable bacterial infections. So this is, I would say, a combination of evolutionary thinking with modern molecular medicine. And it is starting to show some real hope for providing us with therapies that we can use after we run out of all the antibiotics that the drug industry has come up with because the bacteria have evolved resistance to all of them. So I think that's an important clinical contribution, and it does have an element of evolutionary thinking in it. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think you could hear me talking about evolutionary processes while we went through that. The second area that I would like to mention where there is a real potential is in cancer research and cancer therapy. Every cancer is an independent evolutionary process. And a cancer isn't a single thing. It is a genetically heterogeneous collection of clones. And each one of those clones differs from each other clone genetically because it's had different mutations. And these different clones are competing with each other inside the body. And it's because there are these different clones that when we use chemotherapy to try to cure someone of cancer, the usual pattern is that the cancer goes away for a while, but then it comes back. And the reason it comes back is that there are resistant clones, just as there are resistant bacteria. And unfortunately, <laughs> I've done some research on this, and I'm a cancer survivor, so it's personal. Uh, I know that our ability to detect a clone of cancer cells visually using the various kinds of optical techniques that, that we now use in scans and MRIs and various other methods is about a million cells. That means that you could have a clone of 100,000 cells that was resistant to chemotherapy hiding out in some part of your body, and you would never see it. You would think that your cancer had disappeared but it was still there, and it could come back. And so often what we see in uh, the treatment of a cancer patient is that the initial chemotherapy works, the cancer patient comes back, uh, six months, a year, two years later, they try another kind of therapy, same thing happens, they try another kind of therapy, the same thing happens, and then finally the patient dies. Well, just as with antibiotics, what's going on is that the chemotherapy is clearing out the competition and letting the resistant cells survive and reproduce. And so Bob Gaddenby and some of his colleagues have suggested that maybe we should treat cancer with what they call adaptive therapy. And that is, we should image it as well as we can. We apply the chemotherapy. We see that the growth goes down, but then we stop it. We don't try to put in so much of the chemotherapy that we're trying to wash it completely out of the body because we know we won't. We know there will be some, some resistant clones. And they tried this on mouse models. So this is the cancer equivalent of not finishing your antibiotics, right? It's not finishing your chemotherapy. <laughs> they tried it on mice and they discovered that it worked. They were able to significantly extend the lifespan of mice infected with cancers. And the data were good enough that they were given permission to do a stage one trial with humans. And that is currently going on. And it's going on with breast cancer patients. And it's uh, taking place centered in Florida. So that's an evolutionary insight. And it's based on the idea that every cancer is a clone. And it's evolving in competition with other clones. And it acquires its ability 
to metastasize and kill through a series of mutations. And if we are careful about how we try to kill it, we can delay the rate at which it will be able to do so by keeping some of the competing cancer clones alive. Now, this only works if those competing clones are less virulent than the resistant clone. Okay, so it won't work in every case. Yeah. So that that is an interesting insight. It's not by any means the most hopeful kind of therapy. I think actually that there are currently some therapies based on taking cancer cells out and training the immune system to recognize them and then multiplying the immune system and re-injecting those immune cells, which are actually more promising. Those are not based on evolutionary insights. Those are based on good molecular medicine. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you something else about cancer, which I think is absolutely fascinating, and it doesn't apply so much in the clinic. It's more a basic research issue. But it stems from this observation. Humans and things like dogs and cats get cancers that can metastasize and spread through the body and kill you. Dogs, uh, excuse me, cows and horses tend to get solid tumors that do not spread and metastasize. There is a fundamental difference in the reproductive biology of those two groups of organisms. Humans have what are called invasive placentas. In other words, when here's what happens. The embryo is fertilized, it comes down the fallopian tube, enters the uterus, and encounters the endometrium. And it then is in a stage called uh, a blast of, it's a blastocyst, and it uh, forms, it has an outer layer of cells, which is called the trophoblast. Those cells actively move and burrow into the endometrium, and the placenta is formed mostly out of fetal tissue that has been derived from the trophoblast. In order to do that, those cells have to move through other cells, and in fact, they are even able to embed themselves in the arteries that are growing out from the mother and give the embryo some partial control over its food supply coming in from the mother. It's not like that in cows and horses. In cows and horses, the trophoblast is not invasive, and at the end of the process, there are two or three layers of tissue between the fetal blood supply and the maternal blood supply. Whereas in humans, the embryo is essentially directly bathed in the maternal blood supply. Now, it is a fact of developmental biology that every cell in the body has the genetic program to do everything that any cell in the body can do. That means that every cell in the body has the ability of those trophoblast cells to move and to insert themselves into other tissue and to detach and to enter blood vessels. Those are exactly the things that metastatic cancer needs to do. It is no accident, therefore, that we see that humans and cats and dogs, which also have invasive placentas, get metastatic cancer, and cows and horses get almost none. That gives one the opportunity to ask, oh, if we study the genetic differences between cows and humans, can we see what genetic changes were necessary in cells to give them that opportunity to invade? And will that give us some understanding of which genes we need to target if we want to target metastatic cancer? Mm -hmm. That is a profoundly evolutionary line of thinking that relies on comparative evolutionary biology, careful description of the differences in reproductive biology, and then coupled with all of the power of modern molecular biology to be able to find those genes. And my colleague Gunter Wagner has done just exactly that. And he has a very interesting group of uh, collaborators. They include people at the University of Connecticut and uh, Wayne University in uh, Detroit and other places around the planet, University of Vienna. And basically what they've done is that they have grown cow endometrial cells in culture and human endometrial cells in culture. And then they've taken trophoblast cells from cows and from humans, and they've allowed them to invade the two different kinds of endometria. And they have harvested cells from that. These are all plates now in vitro, in, in the lab. Uh, 
and characterize them genetically to see which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And it's led to a fascinating story, which is going to have, I think, very interesting fundamental implications. I do not see at this point that it has any rapid, direct clinical applications. I don't think that we can talk about a new cancer therapy coming out of it or not. But I do think that every time we have gained breakthrough and fundamental knowledge like that, we have had a harvest of practical applications in decades to come. So I think that's very exciting. And it gives you a good example of uh, some of what's going on in evolutionary medicine. Now let me turn to the issue of uh, hygiene and autoimmune diseases and allergies and immunobiology, which I think is another very active area. And again, this stems from some broad natural history comparisons that are now being analyzed in much greater detail. Let me start with a large natural history comparison. If you uh, look across the globe at where people have autoimmune diseases, you notice that they are primarily in developed countries and primarily in the north and in the south and not in the less developed countries near the equator. When you then plot on top of that map of where the autoimmune diseases are, where you find people who are carrying parasites and worms, you discover that the people who don't have autoimmune diseases often have a worm infection, and the people who do have autoimmune diseases often do not have a worm infection. So that led to the rough idea that, gee, maybe worms are manipulating our immune systems in ways that reduce the risk of autoimmune diseases. That was one pattern. There were other patterns. If you look across the border between Finland and Russia, what you see is that Finland is a more highly developed country with a higher... By the way, it's important that Russia conquered part of Finland and that the people who are in the part of Russia that's right next to Finland have the same genetic ancestry. They're called Karelians. Okay, so uh, the people in the Russian part of Karelia have one kind of ecology and public health system, and the people on the Finnish side have another. The people on the Russian side are uh, living in a, a, a more intensely farming economy where the children have much more exposure to domestic animals and uh, to contaminated water, and the people on the Finnish side are living in a more hygienic environment. There is a dramatic difference right across that uh, border in type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. The Finns have much more of it, and the Russians have much less of it. You can see similar patterns in the rate at which people get allergies. People who live in cities get frequent allergies more frequently than people who live on farms. There is a clear association between our microbiota and the way we acquire our microbiota and our risk of autoimmune disease. Now, some of the serious autoimmune diseases are uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome, I, IBS, or inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. Uh, Crohn's disease is one of those. And that, that group of people suffers from diarrhea, from pain, from bleeding, from terrible problems. And they really are very interested in trying almost any kind of therapy. I mean, they are people who are driven to desperation in trying to find therapies. And there are some anti-inflammatory drugs that do give them some relief, but there really isn't anything that illuminates the cause of their problem. So they're symptomatic. There's some symptomatic relief, not complete, but no real therapy that gets at the cause. That is the part of the medical community, the people who address those kinds of diseases, that have been most interested in worm therapy. And there are some, there are some very colorful stories out there. There was a British fellow living in California who heard that you might be able to relieve the symptoms of bowel, inflammatory bowel disease if you had a worm infection. So he flew to West Africa and he walked around barefoot in latrines in West Africa and picked up a whopping hookworm infection. And he went back to California. Now, a hookworm infection is non-trivial. I'm not recommending that anyone do this, but... I think it's an indication of how bad his symptoms were that the hookworm infection made him feel better, made him feel a lot better. So even though he had all of the symptoms of hookworm infection, what the hookworms evidently had done to his inflammatory bowel disease was so impressive 
that he decided that he was going to share his happiness with the world. And he started harvesting hookworm eggs from his own feces and distributing them by mail via the internet. And of course, they were contaminated with viruses and bacteria, and this was not approved by the FDA. And so the federal health authorities in the United States evicted him from the country, and all he did was he moved to southern France and he set up again. And I think if you go on the web and you say, where can I buy eggs to treat myself, uh, his site, among others, might pop up. Now, there are places that will provide sufferers of these diseases with various kinds of worm treatments that are much more reliable than that. There are some in Germany, for example. But let me go back to the evolutionary thinking behind this. Mm -hmm. Suppose that you are a parasitic worm in a human body, and you want to be reproductively successful. Now, the only way you can do that is if some of your offspring manage to get into another human body. But, oh my goodness, that is a hard thing to do. You have to get out of this human, and then you have to somehow survive in the external environment, and then you have to somehow get into another human, and that's a very risky process. Mm -hmm. What that means is that parasitic worms have been selected to survive for a long time in humans and to produce millions of offspring so that at least a few of them will survive the transmission process and succeed in getting into another human. In order to do so, worms have had to evolve ways to manipulate the human immune response. They have become sophisticated manipulators of the human immune response. And they do that so that they themselves can survive and reproduce. And that means that they are actually very good at manipulating parts of the human immune response that are doing other things, such as generating allergies or causing autoimmune reactions. And while the worms, for their own purposes and with their own agenda, are changing certain signals in the immune system, which is, are basically uh, ramping the immune system down or depressing our immune system so that they can survive, they are also at the same time, not because they want to, but just as a side effect, reducing the impact of autoimmune diseases on our bodies. So if we go through the modern industrial revolution, we go through the epidemiological transition, we clean up our environment, we have clean water supplies, we have antibiotics, we have modern medicine, and we get worms out of our environment, we are then confronted with autoimmune diseases. And if you look at the pattern of autoimmune diseases in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, you will see that as infectious diseases and worm infections have gone down, autoimmune diseases have gone up. It's a global pattern. So this has become a very interesting and uh, hot area of research in immunobiology. It has definite clinical implications. I would say they're not fully worked out yet. Um, there have been clinical trials where people were taking cocktails of pig whipworm eggs, 2,400 eggs every six hours for five days and things like that. that by the way, that particular one was selected because that is a parasite that cannot establish itself in humans. It can only establish itself in pigs. And uh, there have been mixed results. I think what people would really like to do, at least in the pharmaceutical industry, is figure out how are the worms doing that and can we isolate some molecules that we can market as drugs. Then we can make money on it and we don't need the worms. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the issues that's currently being confronted is, do you actually need to have a live worm? In other words, do you need to have a living organism that's dynamically responding to the immune microenvironment in the body to get this effect, or can you mimic a worm with drugs? And that, at this point, is an open question. But this whole uh, idea and this whole line of research goes back to the observation that we are mismatched to our current environment, which is much cleaner than our environment used to be, and that our evolutionary biology has not yet caught up 
And it's that evolutionary insight which has then driven all of this other research, which is mostly non-evolutionary and mostly just good molecular medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So about evolutionary mismatch, uh, is this a concept coming from evolutionary theory that can shed new light on certain health issues in modern that are very prevalent in modern industrialized societies? Sure, that leads right on from our previous conversation about hygiene and worms and autoimmune diseases. So that's an example where we are mismatched because we no longer have worms in our bodies. But there are many other aspects of our modern environment which are probably having important effects on us. Um, I think that uh, we do not yet understand the impact of artificial light on our mood, our psychology, and our sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. I think the evolution of sleep patterns is fascinating, and it's very different in modern humans than it was in hunter-gatherers. I have a colleague, uh, Charlie Nunn, who investigates sleep patterns in not hunter-gatherers, but in, uh, say, pre-industrial agriculturalists in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And the usual sleep pattern in people who do not have electricity is that they go to sleep when the sun goes down. Then they wake up around midnight. They're up for about two or three hours. Then they go to sleep again. And then they wake up when the sun comes up. So they're completely dependent on natural light. And to the great frustration of anthropologists, what they do when they wake up at one or two in the morning is they tell each other stories. <laughs> <laughs> And so out there in the dark of the night in Madagascar, you are to imagine that there are agriculturalists who are developing their whole cultural storytelling tradition at one or two o'clock in the morning. And there are a bunch of Western anthropologists who are trying desperately to not become sleep deprived. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I think you're probably aware of all the research that's been done on the impact of the kind of light that comes out of computer screens and what that does to our sleep patterns, and you can now buy software that causes your computer screen to put out more red light and less blue light as the evening goes on. I don't think that we really know yet uh, the impact of artificial light on our mood and our health. And I say that because I think that sleep is fundamental to health, and I think that its function is to restore our body and our mind every day. And if we disrupt it with artificial light, we are doing unknown things to ourselves. So that's going. Now, there are a bunch of other things that might be mismatched. I mentioned earlier that one of the consequences of the agricultural revolution was cities, and one of the consequences of cities is that uh, people encounter many people in the course of their daily activities with whom they are interacting in either a cooperative or a competitive or a neutral way, who are not relatives. Mm -hmm. The average person that a modern human being meets in the course of a day in a city or a town is not a relative. That's not the way we evolved. We evolved in hunter-gatherer groups of oh, 60 to 80 people who were all related to each other. Now, the Evolutionary theory of kin selection teaches us that our reactions to P to relatives are going to be different from our reactions to non-relatives. Mm -hmm. And I think that ever since we had the agricultural revolution, which is, say, three to 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, depending on where you are, and started living in cities, that selection pressures on our social interactions shifted. Furthermore, uh, and this is an idea that uh, comes from evolutionary anthropology. If our brains were adapted to interact with 60 to 80 people, they probably never had the capacity to interact with hundreds or thousands of people. And they might become confused or disoriented when asked to keep, try to keep track of that many different potential interactions. And to associate a personality and an expectation with each of those many interactions. Now, clearly, cities did something to that, but my goodness, look at what social media have done to that. Once you get onto Facebook or onto Twitter and you are trying to deal not only with 
hundreds or thousands of different individuals, but also with a very limited input with information about who they are and how they might respond and what they might be doing, I think that you find that our cognition becomes very challenged. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of indications that certain kinds of mental diseases or mental states are increasing in frequency in developed countries and that you are less likely to encounter them, although not, you're not totally absent, but you're less likely to encounter them in less developed countries. And they may also be examples of mismatch. And here I am thinking of autism, schizophrenia, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, things uh, like Depression, perhaps. Depression, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have, uh, I think this is a very interesting area. I have colleagues in evolutionary medicine who concentrate on it. It's a very hard area in which to do uh, solid science. Uh, one of the difficulties is that some of these mental conditions are simply diagnosed differently in different medical traditions. I was involved in a study in Denmark where we were studying autism and schizophrenia, and it turned out that people who had been trained in Copenhagen in the southeast had different diagnostic criteria than the people who had been trained in Aarhus in the north, northern part of Denmark. And we had to account for that in our study design. So there's, it's a difficult area, but I think it's a fascinating one, and I think that we're all aware that there are many more people now who seem to be anxious, depressed, or have attention deficit syndrome, or who have obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, who have some kind of mental disorder. And I think some of that may be because our brains and our learning abilities are mismatched to our modern environment. And I, th I think that's plausible and I think it's fascinating and I think it's hard to do research on it and I don't think we have good, well-supported examples yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can evolutionary theory also inform public health, and in what ways? It definitely can, and there's a whole branch of public health which is called evolutionary epidemiology. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the big distinctions between clinical medical practice and public health and epidemiology is that the clinician, the physician in the hospital, is looking at a single individual and is trying to do whatever they can to make that single individual healthy. The public health person or epidemiologist is looking at an entire population and is asking themselves, what is the good that I can do for the entire population? And at first sight, it might seem that those are not necessarily in conflict with each other. But if we go back to the physician looking at the single individual, that physician is making a series of decisions about therapy that include antibiotic use and vaccination and other things that when added up translate into big population impacts. Mm -hmm. And there are certain ways of using antibiotics and vaccinating people that have good consequences at the population level and there are others that have bad consequences at the population level. But because the focus is on such different levels, there's a real problem of communication and understanding. And what the population level processes include is evolution. So antibiotic resistance evolves at the level of the population. Mm -hmm. But it is driven by thousands and millions of decisions by individual physicians writing prescriptions. Right. Herd immunity arises at the level of the population through vaccination programs, and the escape from vaccines, the evolutionary escape from vaccines by pathogens evolves at the population level. But the decision, do I or do I not vaccinate, is often in the hands of individuals. Now, in that case, with vaccinations, it's often a public health uh, program that does it rather than in, an individual physician. But in both cases, both in antibiotics and in vaccines, there is a conflict sometimes between the interests and the perceptions of individuals and the benefit of the whole population. And so what evolutionary epidemiology does is it tries to give you a very clear analysis of what's good for the population as a whole, 
so that it can at least be clearly discussed in terms of what the individual, both the individual doctor and the individual patient, want for themselves. And there are some interesting insights there. I would say that one of the biggest interesting insights is what happens when we apply an imperfect vaccine. Mm -hmm. So to make clear what an imperfect vaccine is, let me first define what a perfect vaccine is. A perfect vaccine is one of the childhood vaccines for conditions like mumps or measles or diphtheria or tetanus that are essentially sterilizing and give lifelong immunity. In other words, those are vaccines that are so good that they completely eliminate the infections and they give you a patient who is going to resist those infections and cannot be reinfected. An imperfect vaccine is a vaccine that will work for some proportion of the patients, but not for all of them. And it can allow other resistant strains to survive. Now, here is an important evolutionary concept that is a key feature of evolutionary epidemiology. It is thought that a pathogen like a virus or a bacterium experiences a trade-off between its virulence and its ability to transmit. In other words, it's probably most easily seen in a case like Ebola. Ebola is so virulent that it isn't good for itself. In other words, it kills people so rapidly that it doesn't have an opportunity to transmit. And therefore, in most cases in the past, Ebola has not spread very effectively. In the most recent case in the Eastern Congo, it did. But it's an example of an extremely virulent disease. Mm -hmm. Diseases that transmit effectively often are less virulent because they, uh, the reason they can transmit is that they allow the patient, the, the host that they infect, to survive longer and to continue to move around and to have contact with other potential hosts. And so a fundamental idea in evolutionary epidemiology is that there's a balance between virulence and transmission and an optimum level would be selected. And this has been well documented uh, in some animal diseases, such as the virus that was myxomatosis that was used to control rabbits in Australia. And it is an idea that informs thinking uh, about many human diseases. It has not always been demonstrated. There have been lots of uh, experimental attempts to show that there's a trade-off between virulence and transmission in, in many different kinds of organisms. And sometimes you find it and sometimes you don't. But let's suppose that in the case of imperfect vaccines, it really exists. Here's what it means. If we apply an imperfect vaccine to a human population and the thing it's vaccinating against has a virulence transmission trade-off, what we are doing is we are allowing, we are reducing the cost of being virulent because the vaccine is providing partial protection against that. What that means is that the imperfect vaccine is selecting for more virulent strains. We've reduced the cost of virulence. There was a trade-off that shifts the evolutionary optimum. More virulent spray strains can evolve. Uh, this idea has been tested and demonstrated to be correct in some instances using mouse models of malaria. And I would like to note that there are two important vaccines that are we know are imperfect. One is malaria vaccines. Every malaria vaccine which has been discovered is imperfect. They think it's a good one if it's 50% effective. They would be delighted if it were 70 or 80% effective. The other one, which is quite broadly used, is the human papillovirus vaccine, the HPV vaccine, which is used to try to prevent cervical cancer in women and various kinds of cancer in men. It's caused by a sexually transmitted virus. Mm -hmm. And it is also a highly imperfect vaccine that allows uh, a large percentage of the strains of that virus that are circulating to continue to circulate because it's not effective against them. So the evolutionary insight basically is that, oh, if we're using an imperfect vaccine on a large population of humans, we can expect that the pathogen that we are trying to vaccinate against will evolve greater virulence. This doesn't mean that we should not vaccinate with an imperfect vaccine. Uh, just to take malaria, there are more than one and a half million children who die from malaria every year. 
-hmm. And um, maybe more than that. I may be off on my numbers, but it's a large number, and it's larger than a million. And if an imperfect vaccine saved a million of them, that would be great. But if in the process of using that vaccine, we are knowingly causing the evolution of greater virulence in malaria, then we also have the scientific and the moral duty to start thinking about how are we going to treat it when it becomes more virulent? What will we do with the patients that we are then indirectly causing to have more virulent forms of the disease? And my goodness, when you look at human papillovirus and that cervical cancer, that rapidly becomes a very, very frightening thing to think about. So I think that insight that imperfect vaccines can select for greater virulence, which, by the way, is, is we owe to Andrew Reed and Sylvain Gandon and others, is an important evolutionary insight in evolutionary public health. And uh, I think it's a good example of where evolutionary biology is saying we had better be prepared for some unpleasant surprises that would not have been surprises if we had used evolutionary thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have one last question that comes from a supporter of the show, Bernardo Seixas, and he says, Dear Dr. Stearns, a foundational tenet of life history theory is the existence of trade-offs between different vital functions. Do you believe that current attempts to increase the human lifespan can have negative unintended effects? Well, it's a very interesting question. It's a good one. It's one that I discuss every time I teach evolutionary medicine, and it's one that I have, in fact, discussed directly with Jennifer Doudna, who got the Nobel Prize for CRISPR. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is the background. We have an increasing incidence of chronic diseases associated with aging that are emerging in human populations in developed countries as a consequence of our good medicine and our good public health. Mm -hmm. So more people are surviving to be old. If there has been historically a trade-off in genes that promoted uh, good reproduction and survival early in life but had the side effect of increasing risk of chronic disease late in life, well, when we lived shorter lifespans, they would have been selected for. The costs would never have been paid. It would have been buy, buy, buy now, pay later, but the later never came, and so all you got was the benefits in terms of improved reproduction. I've already sketched one example of, of that, um, and that is the relationship between the ability of trophoblast cells to implant in the endometrium and the risk of metastatic cancer. That's something that the implantation in the endometrium happens extremely early in life and is obviously directly important for reproduction. And the risk of metastatic cancer is something that happens 40, 50, 60 years later. So there's definitely a connection between the early life and the late life effects that constitutes a nicely illustrated example of a trade-off. But let us suppose what would happen if we tried to treat metastatic cancer with genetic engineering on germline. So we took, say, cells in a Petri dish, and we were going to use artificial reproduction on them. And we took out the genomes of the mother and the father, and we substituted genes that had to do with metastatic ability in the mother and the father. We put them back in the Petri dish, and then we tried to re-implant those into a woman and have an embryo form in the woman. Well, that embryo would have a very hard time burrowing into the endometrium, and it would be very difficult from the point of view of assisted reproductive technology to have a successful pregnancy if that was what was going on. So one of the fundamental issues that you encounter with genetic engineering of humans is, are you doing it on the germline or are you doing it on the adult organism? If you're doing it on the germline, then you're doing it on, uh, in such a way that not only does that human being get the genetic changes, but then it's going to be inherited by its offspring. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but anything that gene does late in life will also be there early in life. And so any sort of manipulation of the germline runs directly into the issue of trade-offs between reproduction and survival. However, if you do somatic gene therapy, 
say, on a person who has completed reproduction. Here they are. They're 40, they're 45, they're 50 years old. And you develop some kind of vector that will allow you to go in with precision and replace genes and substitute different versions of them in the adult body, all 10 trillion cells of the adult body, you then manage to fix the costs without having done anything to disturb the benefits that were early in life. So you're going in later in life and you're just dealing with the risk of cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's and things like that later in life. And uh, let me just give you some examples of the sorts of genes that you might want to target. There's a, there's a gene called APOE4, uh, which uh, is involved in cell-cell recognition and uh, is something which is a bit different in humans than it was in chimpanzees. And it turns out that it, persons with a certain version of this have a much reduced risk of dying from diarrhea when they are infants. Mm -hmm. However, they have an increased risk of dying of Alzheimer's disease. So it's an identified gene that has a positive effect early in life and a negative effect late in life. And it might be one of the things that one wanted to think about if one was doing somatic gene therapy on someone who was 50 years old. So that's a nice one because I've just mentioned one word. It's one gene, ApoE4. However, what about something like cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease? It turns out that there are about 70 genes that have been identified as increasing the risk of coronary artery disease, and 40 of them are particularly well characterized. And all of those top 40 have two interesting attributes. The first is that they all do something beneficial early in life. So they increase the risk of heart disease late in life, but every single one of them has been identified as having a benefit for either survival or reproduction early in life. The other is that they all carry in them signatures that they have responded to selection in the last recent period of human history. So uh, clearly something has been happening to change selection pressures on the genes that affect risk of coronary artery disease. But if you think about trying to do genetic therapy on that, it seems to be a nearly impossible task. Not only do you run into the problem that, gee, they also have benefits, you also run into the problem that there are so many of them and that each of them has such a small effect. They all add up to a big risk, but each of them has a small individual impact. That's not a very good candidate for doing sophisticated gene therapy. Uh, it would be extremely expensive, probably ineffective, and, uh, and certainly not something that one would want to contemplate for a large population of people. I think it's only for desperate billionaires. Uh, wouldn't another problem there be the fact that if we are dealing with uh, lots of genes that, um, I mean, with polygenic traits, in this case, traits that are influenced by or the result of many different genes, that some of them might have pleiotropic effects. And so that would be one of the reasons why, for example, we would be treating something but would increase the probability of the person developing another sort of health issue. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I was actually trying to illustrate that concept with the heart disease example. So thank you for restating that in other words. But what we discovered is that heart disease is affected by many genes and that each of them has pleiotropic effects. And in many cases, the nature of those pleiotropic effects is that that's, that's one gene will cause something good early and something bad late in life mm -hmm. for many genes. And so, yes, if we did try to treat that, uh, we would probably... Unless, unless we delayed the therapy, the genetic intervention, until people were 50 years old or older, we probably, if we did it in the germline, we would be causing disruptions of reproduction and survival early in life. And I think that gets at something fundamental about uh, one of the basic concepts of evolutionary medicine. If you look at an organism coming from a chemical or a phys physicist's or an engineering perspective, you think of an organism as something that has parts that can break, and if we can replace the broken parts, we can fix it. 
But if you look at an organism as something that has evolved in which uh, genes have been selected, where I was going was how do trade-offs evolve? And why, do we, why does evolutionary medicine not see patients as machines with parts that can be replaced, mm -hmm. but as bundles of trade-offs of complex interaction systems? And there are really two important things to realize about evolution. One is that evolution will tolerate high costs if it can get high benefits. Mm -hmm. So that means it will accept and it will actually use a gene that is beneficial just as long as the benefits are even greater than the costs. But that's why we have trade-offs. The other is that there is a real, uh, well, I don't want to go into the whole process of building organisms and all of the reasons why things that happen early in life are more likely to be important for evolution than things that happen late in life. But if you just take that idea that evolution is willing to pay a high cost if it gets an even higher benefit, and if you can imagine that something that happens early in life is likely to be more beneficial than something that happens later in life, then you end up with the evolutionary theory of aging. And you realize that we are not going to be able to use evolution, engineering thinking to successfully treat complicated biological systems. We're going to have to try to understand how they are linked internally. And unfortunately, I have to report that my understanding is that those linkages are tremendously complicated, and therefore the probability of unpleasant surprises is pretty high. In other words, because a lot of stuff is tied together, if you change one thing, you're going to be changing a lot of other things. And it's hard to know which other things you might be changing. And I think what that gives us is an important cautionary note. Uh, I, I've referred to a number of complicated stuff, but I can reduce it to a very simple proposition. Mm -hmm. And that is, if we want to do gene therapy on humans, we have to proceed very carefully and we have to be modest about what we know. And we have to admit that there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. Because if we don't do that, we're going to have some very unpleasant surprises. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just before we go, um, are there any good places on the internet where people can find your work? Well, if they go to YouTube, but they defy, if you go to YouTube and you search on evolutionary medicine sterns, you will get a set of 65 short lectures. They're each about 15 minutes long that take you through all of the major areas of evolutionary medicine. And if you go to YouTube and you search on ecology, evolution, ecology, and behavior, Stearns, you will get a set of 39 lectures, each of which is somewhat longer, that is kind of an introductory course in ecology and evolution. So those are places on the web where you can go. Now, there are some others, and I would think that, uh, you know, Google has been my friend a lot, and I'm sure Google will be your friend as well. Uh, I'm sure there are other similar resources. Those are simply the ones I know about because I did it, so. Okay, great. So I will include that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Stearns, again, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you. Ricardo, good to meet you, and thank you. Goodbye. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, 
Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zoop, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.